My name is Sarah, and I live in the UK with my dad. I don't need to worry about the cold outside. Western sport has led to soaring unemployment, with many unable to feed their families or even to keep them. But it upsets me to see children in Afghanistan suffering during the winter. I want to make them happy. Let's remind them they are not alone. Let's share the warmth with families in Afghanistan who have no means of heating by donating today. Bring a smile to an innocent child. www.amamahusseincharity.com Here we go, welcome once again to The Late Night Show with myself, Ali Fadl, um, here presenting to you uh, a fantastic late night show, uh, as mentioned. So it's slightly not censored, um, in a sense, although it is edited. However, I do advise that children do not um, look at these programs. I'm joking. It's open to all. It's fine. Anyway, uh, a man called the Saf uh, Safwan was present in the company of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, So what happened then was a citizen uh, of Mecca arrived, kind of distressed about something. So he sat beside the Imam. Uh, and described in, pro uh, in, in, in kind of detail uh, the problem that he had. So it was, it was a financial problem, gone slightly problematic due to the mismanagement by both parties that were involved. So the Imam immediately ordered his companion, Safwan, to go with the believer and help him solve his, his problem. Very, very simple. Safwan did as he was asked and solved the problem with the wisdom uh, and the resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with. Now, when he returned to the Imam, the Imam then asked him, so what happened? Uh, and Safwan said, yeah, very simply, the Almighty solved the problem. So this is when the Imam said, look, remember, solving a minor problem that demands a little bit of your time is worth more in Allah's sight than circling the Kaaba seven times. The Imam actually went further to say, let me relate an incident from the life of my grandfather, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, to Safwan. So he said this story to Safwan. So he's saying, in terms of being able to use your time to support people, he said to him, one day a man actually came uh, seeking the aid of Imam al Hassan. Alayhi Imam didn't stop to think. He put his, uh, put his feet into his slippers, got up to accompany him. On the way, they passed by the mosque and saw Imam al Hussein offering his prayers. So Imam al Hassan turned to the man and said, How come you saw Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, but didn't? go to him, you came to me. The man said, well, I mean, looking at the Imam, he was clearly in a state of i'tikaf or worship in, uh, in isolation. And this is the interesting part, because Imam Hassan said, but if Hussein salam had got the opportunity of solving your problem, it would have been worth more than a whole month of worship in isolation. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming a guest that has spent more or less his entire life seeking to help people. Listen to this. Two awards from Her Majesty the Queen of England, uh, or the UK, sorry. An MBE, is it UK, England? We'll find out later. Uh, an MBE in 2012 for services to communities in London and youth. An OBE in 2019 for services to faith communities. He's the director of Faiths Forum for London, the former director of Mosque and Imams Advise, or National Advisory Board, MINAB, as they like to be called. Uh, he's been working with different communities affected by the pandemic. One of the pioneers of APSOX. If you don't know what that is, we'll find out again. Uh, actually, he was, he was very instrumental uh, and a founder of the idea of APSOX and was a key in, in working across different universities in London to establish societies that could serve the Shia community. He's also one of the founders of Harakah al-Haydariyah, not Husseiniyah. Uh, one of the founders of Harakah al-Haydariyah. 
um, and actually has uh, uh, or set up a boxing club in the back of a mosque um, and a youth club as well. There's a bit of an interesting story that we'll share later on with Hajj, the, or, or I was about to say who it was, uh, with, the, with my guest um, later on in the, in the show. So, he is a fellow for the John Smith Trust and is involved in strengthening the rule of law and countering sectarianism. I don't even pr pronounce that right or not, but anyway, sectarianism, sorry. Essentially, this guy is an influential member of the British Iraqi community, which gives me great pleasure in welcoming Mr. Mustafa Field. Come forth, Mr. Mustafa, please. Sorry for the long-winded introduction, but mashallah, your, your CV is quite, um, quite detailed. Um, and so we're going to pick your brains and find out a bit more about what really makes you kind of tick. But first and foremost, how are you, Hajj Mustafa? Alhamdulillah, very well. Good to Good. see you. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. Um, really, really appreciate your time. Uh, and look, I think we'd love to start to, uh, finding out more about you, I, say, I guess. And, and, and the whole idea is, just tell us a bit about, more about uh, Mustafa Field. I mean, is there a title before Mustafa? Is it like a, a, a Dr. Mustafa or, or a, just a Mr.? It's just a Mustafa Field. Just Mustafa Field, yeah? You don't yes. really like titles, do you? Haji. Haji? Good. <laughs> okay, good, good. Haji Mustafa Field. So look, where were you born? Where did you, where did you grow up? Um, so I was born in Iraq, in Basra. Mm. And uh, at the age of uh, two and a half, I left Iraq. Okay. So I didn't really have any recollections of my stay in Iraq. And uh, we arrived in the UK, and I've travelled across the UK. So I started off in Glasgow. Okay. Went all the way to Manchester. Okay. Uh, lived in Old Trafford. And you, then you, well, you didn't live in Old Trafford. You lived next. I mean, it, the uh -huh. area is called Old Trafford. Oh, so is it? All areas. So, yeah. <gasps> oh my God! Because so the stadium is called Old Trafford. So I thought when yeah. you said live in Old Trafford, I, okay. So you're a United fan then? My United fan. By Aqida, yes. By Aqida. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, you lived in yeah, you lived in Manchester for a bit. And um, I I moved to Surrey, Guildford. Okay. Then, if you guys know it, and uh, now I've been in London since for well, good twenty odd years. So twenty odd years. I actually didn't know that you were you were born in in Iraq. I, knowing you, I thought you were born in the the UK. But your parents came here quite early, didn't they? Yes. Okay. So Tell us a bit about. I guess field. Where did where did because it's not a very traditional Iraqi Iraqi name. So where did where did field come from? So my grandfather settled in Iraq and embraced the faith of Shiism okay. in Iraq. And uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, after accepting, we are the third generation now. Oh, wicked! So so all right, cool. So so I guess that makes it easier for your conversations with non-Muslims then when you say you're Muslim. Field it doesn't absolutely have no. I don't think it makes a big difference because I'm still I look different, so <laughs> <laughs> I look foreign. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably more confusing with Iraqis. We're trying to work out <laughs> what is field in Arabic. <laughs> what is field in Arabic actually? Uh, it's, it's yeah. quite you know, it's field. It's really no. So what's what is it? <laughs> I've had some actually, what, 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 what is? If anyone knows, please do like what, uh, WhatsApp, tweet, whatever it is. What does field? What, what is field in Arabic? Hadiqa? It's not hadiqa. Is it hadiqa? <laughs> No. I don't know, we'll yeah. find out, we'll find out. Okay, so gr growing up in London, I guess um, education was quite key to your, um, to, your, to your thinking. Of course, your parents um, pushed you down that route. How was, how was university for you? Where, where, where did you study? So I, I, I took on a course uh, called uh, Statistics and Operational Research. I'm really a person who likes to do an analysis and I'm a very operational person, so I like to see how things uh, work. It's okay. probably where you would probably like work, work like risk anal analysis All right. and a lot around uh, understanding processes in, in, in the industry and uh, at my state university it was really interesting because I was like uh, I was at the University of Westminster mm -hmm. and uh, we I began university at the time of 9-11 uh, and so okay. it was really an interesting time for us as Muslim students going right. into university with a whole lens of fear around terrorism and mm. discrimination and uh, actually, I think there was a real significant challenge around Shia phobia. I mean, at that time, I think there wasn't a strong, there was very aggressive, uh, you know, groups like Al-Mahajirun and Hizb tahrir uh, and other sort of like groups were quite active and quite aggressively anti-Shia. Oh. Um, and that really led to conversations around ahl societies. And actually, at the time, I remember speaking to many of our elders in our, in our mosques, the imams and the shiuch and, um, and different figures and I think there, there were you know, real convictions that we need to embrace something to protect Shia students oh, and so oh. that's where we 
university was a really interesting time where I was able to establish Elbit societies and was actually running across London trying to no get them set up on different campuses. And so that, I guess the, the whole 9-11 situation in Islamophobia, which then obviously led into kind of more Shiaophobia, that's, that's the, the driving force behind setting up the Elbit societies? I think say. so, particularly the Shiaophobia. Um, I think there wasn't a space for Shias. Um, and at the time, they were quite aggressive. Where, where, where did this, um, this, uh, this drive to protect Shias uh, and community work, I guess, come from? Where, where, did, where did it come from? I think it definitely started uh, at home with the family. Parents right. had a really important role. My, my parents were, um, obviously, they came here as refugees from Iraq, but they came uh, early, and so often they hosted various... Uh, individuals and family and so our house was kind of the house that was always open for people to come over and there was a lot of like jalsa or gatherings and, mm -hmm. and, and, and meetings and often people who didn't have a home would you know would come home to our yes. place and, and, and set on so I think we were always wary and I think you know going through the centers we, we built a strong Shia identity but we didn't often talk about our, our Shianess outside I think yeah. it was an identity crisis uh, for us uh, and talking about our identity. So really, I mean, it probably was a reaction to the negative uh, backlash we had uh, due to some extreme selfies pushing a very anti shia rhetoric on campus mm. um, and we wanting to be a community. I think that was the, the backlash because we all, we've always wanted to be part of the Muslim community, working with others. We're, we're happy to be inclusive. We want mm. to be. And, but I think you know, the aggression was so much that the only route was to establish something to allow us to practice our faith. That's what I'm, I'm asking, where, where, where did this interest in, in, in Shiism come from? I think why, I was, not, why, I, not, I, I, why not the Muslim, Muslims overall, I guess? So I think there was Islamic societies on campus, and so that was, uh, and often they were run by uh, groups, and some of them weren't always as tolerant. Okay. So in some universities, it was nice guys running it, but often, and some, I, can, some of the, I can remember some of the nasty guys running those guys, really? ISOX. And I remember meeting the uh, Imam the first time who was doing the Salat al Jummah. I said, like, Yeah, I was trying to introduce myself as someone from the Shia community. He goes, We don't regard you guys, brothers, as Muslims. <gasps> well, and, and even some of these Sunnis, I don't regard as Muslim as well. They're, they're like straight up to your straight face, up, no, there's no, no filter. No, no, no. There, there was no need of a filter those days. And, uh, you know, so it was actually, wow. um, you, know, you know, actually the first time you really faced it and so actually I was worried about a lot of my fellow Shias who didn't yeah. feel left out and I often was the one who was leading the debates and discussions with them and alhamdulillah I think being the first sort of generation of the Iraqi community going into university mm. and getting active with the young people I guess that that forced me to take that position. Wow, wow. Okay so then then it wasn't just universities you were more involved in the community as well is that only for the for, for the Iraqis tell us a bit more about the community work at large within, within London that, that you're involved with? I think we you know, embraced a very strong Shia identity. I think uh, university was a time that we started to get to know Shias from across the world. Oh. We met people who were from, you know, from the Khoja community to the Iranians. So often we, I mean, I, I was lucky, I did have interaction with the, um, the, the Shia community and being in London is quite a mixed community and you can go to Stanmore, you can go to other centres yeah. uh, and get to know different members of the community but it's, yeah. our interaction was limited. Often I would really go, you know, on, on our, our Muharrams, our Ramadans would be mainly with many Iraqis, uh, Iraqi community, sometimes with Bahrainis and others. So it was a real time that we established friendship and relationships yeah. with um, the uh, different Shia and I guess that that built an identity that we, we something that the love of Ahl al-Bayt was what united us and, you know, love for the household or the family and the Prophet. That, that really was what brought us together wow. uh, and alhamdulillah it inspired us to go beyond our university practice. So we were able to go out and establish, uh, we established a youth club yeah. and a boxing club uh, in the back of a mosque. Um, Speaking of the boxing club, by the way, I did, I did promise I was going to send, like, say a very uh, kind of interesting story. So you probably don't know this because you were organizing something. Uh, Muslim basically in any sort of gathering, he wouldn't just sit still. He's organizing something and he, something needed to be organized. So he's organizing. Anyway, so um, what happened was uh, they were setting up the, the boxing and, and they had the, uh, the gloves and everything. And, and I was quite new because 
you know, I, I, I came from a very kind of niche background, Rasulullah Azam in, in, in London, and so we weren't really exposed to different communities. And I guess with your great work, we were able to kind of mix and match with different backgrounds, Any, even Iraqi backgrounds, which was, even for us as Iraqis, is an eye-opener. You know what I mean? So anyway, so I was just meeting loads of people, and it was nice, it was fun, everything. So we, they were matching people to have a, a boxing match. And then I, I put the gloves on, and there was a guy who was like, not twice the size, but he was quite big, and I don't know how they matched him with me anyway. So uh, I was literally like uh, I don't know how I don't know how it works like boxing you, uh, you, you're three two one is it a bell you say go is it fight anyway so I was I was doing the straps I was literally just doing the straps I heard someone say go um, and so I was still doing the straps and this guy he literally just closed his eyes and then walloped me <laughs> walloped me straight so I didn't like I, I obviously fell I don't know if I fell unconscious but it was like Quite a bad experience, um, that boxing thing that you, that, that, that you set up. Um, it toughened you up. It toughened you up. Not really. I, I, was, <laughs> I was just scared to go back to the ring anymore, and I just left it as they were. So yeah, that's a, a funny story of, uh, of how I, I got boxed up. I hope people from the mosque trying to bully people from the other mosque. I think that it was. Be. I think it was, to be honest with you. Because when they saw us, and we were quite rowdy, and I thought, you know what? This, we, got, we got a chance. Teach guys a lesson. Yeah. <laughs> All right, fantastic. So I guess moving on, I, I then attended with you uh, one of my first and and, and the most amazing experiences in, in Medina and Mecca. Um, so you thought, okay, let's not just focus on, on, on London. We want to send these people out internationally and get them a, um, a, a, a taste of Ziara. I think at the time, Iraq wasn't applicable, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it was... It probably it was difficult for us to do a trip to Iraq. It was difficult to do a trip. Right, so, so your trips obviously started in the, in the UK. I also attended with you guys to like different cities, three hours away, four hours away, Manchester and all that. Um, but our first real, my first and anyway, real international experience was was Medina. Tell us about a bit about organising, taking youth away from London, and going into a place as volatile as 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 Medina Mecca. I say volatile in the sense that you know there's Wahhabis and 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 so and and so on and so on. I think firstly it was really like a personal experience for ourselves that many of myself and my colleagues, uh, who were the organisers, we ourselves felt a a, a spiritual growth by visiting. Uh, Al Haramain and and, 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 and and growing ourselves and for the first time you lay your eyes on the Holy Kaaba it's something really it really is emotional it is. and it's it cru is. truly incredible experience, it is an experience yeah. and and then when you take your heart to Medina mm -hmm. and 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 you're really able to you know connect to your identity you 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 see you know Masjid al Nabawi you go and see the Imam Salam you 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 understand the hatred for them in some ways as well. You see the hatred because mm. you're, you're just trying to connect with them at Jannat al Baqir, yeah. and you can see the hostility, and that actually creates awareness and maybe a glimpse of the hostility that they experience. And I think that that spiritual journey for us was huge uh, in, in growth, not to be uh, connected to spiritual journeys, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they took a very, very, very bait kind of two, a spiritual and a journey. So put it together, it's the best Ziyadah group you can ever get. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So, uh, so I think it actually it was really important for us and, and then to, to give people the other opportunity that we were able to experience. Yeah. And I remember our first trip, uh, I think Sayyidah Mara allowed me, I mean, that was... Uh, inshallah, that umrah was accepted because there was, you know, we were learning on the job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys, alhamdulillah, <laughs> you guys, you know, you guys came in. We were, we had proper uh, scholarly uh, advice and guidance. And oh, we, we, we had we, no, no, we had scholarly advice and we also had mischievous advice and exactly how to to, to be mischievous. At certain I times. don't know about that. No, you don't know anything about that. I, I assure you, you don't know anything about that. But um, but they were fun times. Can you tell us any stories from behind the scenes about, I guess, some of the any juicy stories that that probably we shouldn't know, but it's okay to know about. Now, I, what I mean by that is, for example, you know, did someone was there a problem that you, you had to kind of fix at the time? I know that I went through a problem um, in 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 Baqiya, but uh, uh, any stories of maybe. Um, uh, 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 the the volatility towards the Shia that you could that you can share. I think um, the you know there were so many lessons to be learned, and I think um, we w what we experienced is you know when you travel with your friends, you really you start to get to know them mm -hmm. uh, and actually know what their pressures uh, and and people with different personalities. And Umrah can be great, but it can also be an exhausting experience for some yeah. and, and draining and, yeah. and you get to test different people's patience 
and even their appetite with food and, and, and fussiness. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think... It's like, just the, get the, on the, with it, man. So it's much. the only food that we have. Just get yeah. on with yeah. it and eat. There, there's yeah. so much that we could <laughs> share with you, but I think, uh, you know, I think the, the Umrah is so, uh, I think, is so interesting because we had such a diverse group of different muqallideen, mm. okay? Um, and I remember some of the brothers, for example, not being able to travel yeah. under uh, shading. Do you, uh, remember, do you remember this, uh, this particular trip? Sorry to cut you. Sayyid, Sheikhna, Haji. Sayyid, Sheikh, Haji, Haji Mustafa. Do you remember this particular yes, trip? Yes, this is a, uh, I remember oh, the Sayyid Jawad. So this was a famous trip. This is this a very is, famous this trip, was, yeah. This is the one we, that we all uh, got arrested in. And we, we all appeared in uh, all the TV stations. Exactly, because, exactly. Uh, we actually spoke about that with, uh, with, with, with Amir and another, um, another uh, tell us about like, your, your side of the experience, actually. Just uh, as in a disc not disclaimer, basically what happened was, but well, actually you could tell us what happened. Why not? You were I think there. unfortunately there was a, an altercation with the Sayyid, where the Sayyid was disrespected. Um, and it's taken to a room in the, in the Haram. Oh. Um, and uh, myself and one of the organizers heard him being hit by the so-called religious police. Yeah. So we did the thing that you all do is you break in <laughs> to the room that they are beating people in, which is, it was the easy bit. <laughs> <laughs> now you had to think about getting out. Uh, <laughs> and the stampede it was like a full-on melee after that, right? It truly was a, a unique experience <laughs> that, um, that, you know, the... the uh, but it was also interesting to see how the civil police and the religious police interact, because they had a fight between themselves okay. well, because of who, who's in charge. Okay. Um, but it was a, a full-blown and uh, unfortunately became an international event. Yeah. Um, you had the Iraqi government pushing out statements. You had the uh, U.S. government saying uh, embassy get involved. You had yeah. the British embassy got involved. Yeah. Um, I guess they were like, how the hell? Who, who are these guys yeah, that got yeah, just arrested? Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. just had three embassies uh, <laughs> and an MP. And you don't know, know who you're statement. messing with, mate. You don't know who you're messing with, yeah. <laughs> and then so like after about five hours of detention, barefoot, hot, you know, yeah. I had I'd sneaked in my mobile phone, so they weren't able to take it. So I was speaking to people abroad while I was uh, oh, wow. in the cell. And uh, we, we suddenly got rolled in with the VIP treatment because they found out that we had so many connections. Wow. So they suddenly we were brought into a, like a really nice so palace. They were humbled, and apologies basically. and, and wow. drinks and, uh, you know, treated very differently. And I don't know if that's the usual treatment or that was something because of our... You know, but it was, uh, yeah. it's those experience. But Alhamdulillah, I think what it did, it, you know, these difficulties actually brought the group closer. And some of the guys that were with us in that group, Alhamdulillah, I thought they yeah. were very well connected. Well, uh, we'll, we'll pause at that um, because after the break, we're going to talk about politics um, and difference between kind of mainstream society and Muslims and how do we get involved and a bit more about your OBE and what that actually signifies and how significant actually is that to the rest of the community. But on that note, um, join us in a couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere because actually after the break, there's a small little challenge that Hajj Mustafa needs to do as well. Thank you. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran will always say, Shall I lead you to a transaction business-wise, which is beneficial for you? Which transaction business-wise is beneficial for us? Those who serve Allah, those who spread the words of Al Muhammad, salawatullah wa salamu alayhim. And this is done wonderfully, you know, in our talk shows live in London, when we have them on Monday nights, the number of people whose lives have been affected. I've seen people, Sheikh Abbas Panjus told me, Sheikh Yahya Simo said, Ali Nawab done great work on the nights of Qadr. I've seen, you know, the morning shows where everybody's coming together discussing social affairs, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, the great work that's being done. I've seen these guys working diligently because uh, we do want to produce more shows to make sure that Imam Al Hussein is known by Muslims and non-Muslims. When you invest with a basic company, with a basic bank, they give you a return. When you invest with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, I don't think there's a return like an investment with Allah. Subhanahu I don't think so. And Imam Ali Alayhi Salam told Imam Hassan, the heart of a youth is like an uncultivated piece of land. Whatever you throw on it, it accepts. We have to recognize that our youth at the moment are listening to all sorts of ideologies, all sorts of philosophies. 
and our aim on this channel is to try and address as many areas as possible to provide the Islamic worldview, Islam's relationship with other religions, Islam's relationship with the concepts of citizen of a state, Islam's relationship with you know the household and the family structure. The only way we're going to do this is by the support which has already been there in amazing ways, but we need more of that support inshallah. Every time there's a salawat mentioned on this channel, it's thawab goes to you. And every time the Ahl al Bayt are mentioned, the thawab goes to you. And every time that there is a show looking at the Quran, the thawab goes to you. Dear guest today is Al Hajj, Mr. Mustafa Field, um, who has a hell of a lot of uh, uh, credentials that I, that I said in the beginning of the show. Um, but today we're going to focus, or actually in this part of the show, we're going to focus more around politics and, and getting involved in mainstream society. But before that, I'm sorry, I need to cough because I've taken one of these. Um, it's essentially a chicken nugget and uh, f covered in Tabasco sauce. And I can see that Hajj Mustafa looks a bit nervous already. Um, and essentially, what happens is, is basically there's one, two, three, four, five questions. Five fairly simple questions. If you get a question wrong, you eat. If you get a question right, you don't have to eat. I took one just now, and that's why I'm saying it's, 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 it's not that bad. So I wouldn't mind getting a question wrong. Got water and milk. We've got water and milk. Water apparently is bad, but milk is good. So we're going to give you the milk just in case. So basically, uh, the way this works, Hajj Mustafa, is basically um, we filled chicken nuggets with Tabasco sauce. Yeah? Uh, one of our guests who was on the show, uh, a dear friend of yours, Amir, uh, Amir Jawad, had quite a bad reaction to, to, to the Tabasco, although his was a bit more horrible because he had three um, cups of ranging Tabasco severity, basically. Um, and he had, to, he had to answer questions about his children. What's their favorite color? What's their favorite sport? And so on. But yours is lighter because it's with food and it's, yeah, and you can eat it, it's fine. Okay, but so that means that, therefore the questions are harder. I'm going to start the first question. The first question is, which Disney princess has the least amount of screen time? God's bless, alhamdulillah, God's bless you with a daughter, right? How old is she? Six, alhamdulillah. Six, alhamdulillah, okay. Cool. And a two-week-old. And a two-week-old, depending on when the show is aired, two-week-old, six-month-old, depending. <laughs> uh, but a newborn, mashallah, alayha. Uh, God bless her, inshallah, take care of her. Um, yeah, which Disney princess has the least amount of screen time? I would not have any clue. Do you know so any I'm of the Disney say. princesses? Disney princesses. <laughs> Who's the person been looking at these questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we've got, for example, um, Anna. Who's a... Who's a <laughs> just take it. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't going to bother with that one. All right, cool. Second question. What was the right question? What was the right answer, by the way? I'm just going to get a VAR. Sleeping Beauty. Oh, is that because she's sleeping most of the time? Oh, wow, that. genius. <laughs> okay, cool. Second question. What is Shakespeare's shortest play? You don't want to know. Romeo one. and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. It's incorrect and it's the comedy of errors as the correct answer. So please. Never heard of it, so. Yeah, yeah me neither. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is now getting tested. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it gonna be difficult now? The first one is a bit of a punchy one, but it goes after a while. Trust me, I've just taken one like 10 minutes ago. All right, ready? Third one. Who designed the Eiffel Tower? You guys are not being easy at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. You could have asked me who designed the Shrine of Mars Well, I actually don't know who designed the Shrine of Mars uh, The architect was, uh, I believe, uh, Sayyid Hassan al-Sharistani. Oh, mashallah. Cool. I did not know that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, who designed the Eiffel Tower? I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know? No clue. No? You don't hazard a guess? The Eiffel Tower? Maybe a guy called Eiffel, Professor Eiffel, Architect Eiffel. Are we going to take Professor or Architect Eiffel? Is Eiffel in his name? Producer. Yes, there is. So you got the correct answer. We can't. We can't. <laughs> uh, and the last one I don't think you're going to get wrong. What's the biggest animal in the world? Well. Which one? Great Whale. <laughs> the Great Whale. 
Uh, no. White. No, that's the great white shark. You're talking about Ooh. the white shark, yeah. A whale. It's the biggest whale. Of course, whales are generally going to be the biggest animals. I'm, I'm usually with the, like wings, birds with wings, not like birds that swim around. So it's the... I love when you just give on us. I'm, forget this. I'm just gonna I love Tabasco sauce, by the way. Oh, is it? Hey, this is like my favorite. Oh I was thinking like, God. you guys brought me a treat, and then I didn't realize. <laughs> I was like, how many can I get wrong? <laughs> and you took one away from me with giving me the clue. <laughs> you wanted to get it wrong on purpose. <laughs> mm, I feel tell Could that be? Could that be? Anyway. All right, brilliant. Thank you so much, Mustafa. That was brilliant. Um, all right, moving swiftly on. I guess um, politics is, is, is a major uh, part of your life. Um, and from what you said, I guess, in the, previous, in, the, in the previous segment, a lot of what you do or what you did in the Absox was politics, right? You, you were, you were uh, kind of speaking on behalf of those who were oppressed and trying to get the, the best for the, the Shia community. But how did that then materialize into more mainstream society? I think... Um I think it's really important for us uh, as Muslims to be engaged in decision making and speaking to people who are uh, making decisions on behalf of our life, be it politics and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it, it is really nice by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it is really nice, yeah. So politics in the mosque, we're trying to get some youth activities set up, be it politics at university to make sure that we're able to uh, mark our religious occasions yeah. around uh, commemorating Muharram. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, as we're living in a world that's actually becoming more hostile to faith, and, mm. and, and particularly Islam, uh, and also often being misunderstood, we've got to be more engaged in looking at how we can influence decision makers, yeah. be it on the boards, on the NHS. And, and one thing that I found very powerful is that when we work together with other religious communities to lobby Lobby. Um, and, and raise awareness and understanding and educate people making decisions to mm. ensure that they account for us and they make sure that they ease the process. So for example, we've seen during COVID how many people uh, were not able to see their loved ones. You met Boris many Johnson? Of the Sorry, of the people. How do you get that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of fishing on your, <laughs> your life. <laughs> We put the image back on, yeah, so that, uh, tell us about this um, particular encounter. So this was actually just uh, after he got elected. Uh, we visited him. Uh, it was actually uh, in Muharram, so I wore black. No Slept, way. Yeah. Uh, no way, I am so proud of you. Yeah. And so that's why I was all wearing black, so that's not usually my attire, but you know. Did you tell him? Because it's Muharram. I didn't get the chance to really explain to him uh, <laughs> the Shia ritual practices uh, oh, right. and, and, and how we commemorate. But inshallah, it's a stepping stone. Uh, so us. we're lobbying so that we, we, from what I gather, it's actually a fantastic point. It's not, not to, basically to get the decision makers uh, uh, being aware that we exist and our rights exist. I think it's really important. I mean, we've seen how... Um, when you're talking about like mental health and there's a big mental health crisis, if you exclude our faith, our spirituality from that process, how do you think, do you think that's really going to help us? And all the leading psychiatrists, psychologists are starting to understand and acknowledge that there are other dimensions to just the scientific world, yeah. that human thing. And so really, I think sadly, the pandemic has put faith back on the map. Yeah. Uh, before the pandemic, I was really um, really involved in doing a lot of work trying to raise, and I'm, my biggest fear is that actually faith-based engagement was constantly being seen as a backward thing. Right. Religion is, you know, as millennials in some way, religion is seen as a backward thing, anti-science, um, um, not progressive. Constricting. Yeah, and, and so, and so we're, we're, we're having an uphill struggle. And so we've, we've, you know, I found it very effective when we work with other groups, other community groups, to raise awareness of the importance of how our faith needs to be put into action. Muslim youth work, Christian youth work, how we need uh, religious slaughter. We've seen the ban on hijab, or the decision that people can be dismissed from the workplace in the European Union. And it's really, really important that we don't allow things in the UK and, and the countries that we live in to go that far. And so it's really important that we are able to build allies mm. with other communities to fight for our rights uh, and to support our communities. That's fantastic, honestly. Um, and so that, 
due, due to the work that you were doing, um, you got recognized for that work. And so tell us a bit about the experience being awarded um, an OBE. I think it was a really uh, interesting, but also great award to, uh, being recognized uh, for my work in the community. It gives you a bit of profile, mm -hmm. allows you, it's an achievement for your organization, for your team as well, because really a lot of my work is down to the team that support me in, in getting that recognition. I, uh, you know, and it, it, in some ways it really helps you in furthering your message because it gives you more credibility. Um, and that's something that I think I've uh, really interested. I can see. Um, so you had to follow video. a certain etiquette yeah. here, didn't you? So it was a really interesting experience. I mean, it's like a graduation. What did you say to him? Grand. Actually, I was speaking to him about Islam and Christianity in the Middle East and, uh, and, 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 and our, our history of, you know, contribution. And I was speaking to him about in Basra, how we had, you know, Christians and Muslims living together. This is a new manifestation that wow. we've seen that Christians, Christianity is being... Did he speak to you or did, or did you kind of prompt the conversation? Because he seems to be talking for a long time. Um, so obviously I, I tried to draft it to the agenda that I wanted to speak about. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a minute and a half possibly. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah, probably, yeah. you know. Uh, what was the preparation like for that? I mean, did they tell you you can do this, you can't do that? And yeah, was so it like visiting one of the, the scholars in the Middle East? So I think... Um, no, no names mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I, th no, I, I, mean, I think once we got there, they did actually give us like a rehearsal, how it works, where you stand, okay. when, you know, there's a whole like rehearsal in terms of like... But it was very quick and they've got like designated points so you know where and where you have to bow and all that kind of stuff. So oh, it's okay. kind of, it's a, it's a nice experience. <laughs> um, and so loads of, there's, there were about 70 of us who oh, were really? doing it at the same time. And so um, different awards, people knighthood, some of them OBE yeah. and whatever. And so it was... It was uh, it was, an experience. it was actually like a really nice experience for the family as well. You go, you know, going into Buckingham Palace. Who was there? So I had um, my uncle, my father, and, and my wife join me. Oh, fantastic. Was really, uh, fantastic. Nice. Um, the, you must have faced a bit of controversy about receiving something from the royal family and I British society and the whole history between Britain and the rest of the world. I think um, for many of us, um, the, the monarchy sometimes reminds us of uh, Britain's past in colonialism um, and particularly you know that that has an impact on people but when you think about the ordinary Brit and the wider Brit and the urf and the in the mushtama uh, in the in the society it really is just about recognition it's about award it's about celebrating uh, people who have made achievements in the society oh. and so I think we've got to recognize look at what is the prevalent message in the society we live in and, and, and make, make decisions, informed decisions, weighing the, the benefit and the, and the cost, because often many of our decisions involve that. And I think the OBE really first brings a spotlight on diversity, people of different backgrounds getting an award, but also it's allowed me to really help people in my community. You know, you know, I, know I know some mosques were having problems doing Muharram in, uh, during COVID uh, practice, and, and they took really important measures trying to um, you know, make sure there's social distancing in place and all these yeah. things. And having a guy sending you an email with an OBE saying, what's going on here? Can you, are you sure you're having a consistent policy applying this on this mosque? With, would you do the same thing with another building? Okay. It's, it makes a difference. It's, it's just most of a feel, but most okay. of a feel OBE makes a difference. So you've got to turn things to a positive. We, okay. we have a lot of challenges, you know. Living in the West, people, some people would say, you know, is, is challenging because there are risks and... Uh, and we're exposed to more likely to be exposed to haram. I'm not sure if that's true, but let's say in that scenario, we are trying, we have to, that's why there's an obligation for us to try and spread our faith. I've, you know, I've worked with a lot of people in terms of thinking about how you can give them character references, references. Um, unfortunately, through my youth work and my experience, there's a lot of young people who do get into trouble. Yep. And you've got to give them character references. Um, and sometimes giving um, people who are making decisions, the judges, and let explaining the context of why this person who's come as a refugee, yeah. who's had a hard life that might need, uh, trying to understand why they've gone this path, might allow them to, rather than sending them to prison, sending them on community service. Yeah. And that for me, I think, spells out why I felt that I should take up an OBE yeah. and serve my community with it. So, I mean, regardless of the hist historical context of monarchy and the colonialism, as you mentioned, but actually having a person who represents uh, the Shia faith in a position of influence. And that's the whole point. It's, it's a position where you can actually influence 
decision makers so that they can then turn around to give you your rights. So for example, those who are actually, I, I don't know, those who were criticizing would probably have a problem with them having a, a program in their mosque with their local community. And therefore we need someone like that in a position to be able to tell them, well actually no, you know, they have the right to do so. So look, hats off to you. I mean, it, it, uh, it's, it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful achievement. I think people who make decisions always going to be criticised, mm -hmm. yeah? and if you're in a position where you are being criticised, sometimes it's worth listening and reflecting on it, mm -hmm. but also remember that you're making change and that's why people criticise it. Absolutely, absolutely. We're going to go to a small break on that note. On the w when we come back, we actually have a showreel uh, or uh, about, I think, 20, 30 photos that we dug up about you, um, and we'd love to know more about it, basically, because they're all very, very interesting. Um, and there's a small little game called Heads Up, which is an ongoing competition throughout all my guests um, and you're going to have to take part whether you're not really good at it good at it we'll find out uh, but anyway stick with us ladies and gentlemen uh, on the late night show with myself Ali Father we're going to be back <laughs> As lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, we all have an inclination to the epitome of love. When we rejoice, when times are hard, whatever stage of life we are in, we all yearn to be in one special place. We all wish to visit the Blessed Shrine of Imam Al Hussein in the holy city of Karbala. Not all of us have the blessing to visit the shrine of Imam Hussein, but there is still a way to experience the sights and sound of the blessed land of Karbala in the comfort of your own homes. We call upon you, dear viewers, to support us in our financial costs to help bring the Holy Land of Karbala beaming into your homes. You can support us with a monthly donation of just 50 US dollars or 30 pounds. We are your gateway to Karbala. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Imam Hussein TV3. show um, we are on the third part of uh, essentially the segment and we are talking to his eminence and Hajj Mustafa Field uh, OBE we have to add the OBE if there's nothing before we have to have something after right so Mustafa Field OBE um, who's joined us and we really thank you so much for your time is more honorable is it you want it okay you want Haji. the honorable Haji 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 is more honorable so you still you're still like you're still holding on to the to the traditional Iraqi and Muslim Heritage, Yani. I think we should be confident in, in sharing our identity with Fantastic. others as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, so we've talked about the serious stuff in terms of your, your involvement in politics and Ziyara groups and um, Haraka. Actually, on that point, um, Haraka al-Haydariya, that was quite a fantastic initiative and which snowballed into a lot of great things. Um, tell us a bit about the thinking behind Haraka just before we move on. There's a lot more things I want to talk about, but Haraka, I want to... I'm very I mean, Haraka, in some ways, was a collection of um, some of the active youth coming together and just thinking, oh, actually, how do we, and we were youth, and how do we strengthen our faith? How do, why are we, we felt very absent that we, there wasn't something for us to gain knowledge in, oh. to meet on a regular basis. And uh, we set up something, in some ways it was very small and it grew into something really big and I think it continued for eight years and then it evolved in different ways. Uh, it was a, you know, alhamdulillah, many people who went on to speaking were uh, first exposed in the Haraka. 
I put my hands up. Um, I had I had my first ever experience in reciting in front of an audience with with Haraka. And actually, I was actually thinking of Haraka because there was a, 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 a quite recently a, a istichad of one of the imams, and I was flicking through some poems, and I found the original poem, the paper that I had from 2000 and I don't know nine ten or something like that. Um, I've got some of your stuff from 2006 five. Really, we've got some videos online. Oh wow! Yeah, I'm yeah. father. I, I I read to your parrot once, Mishmish. Yes. May, may Allah bless his soul. He's passed away, hasn't he? Yes. Yeah. Rahmatullah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Mishmish, I read to your parrot one time. I was in your house. I remember reading. That was quite an, uh, a weird experience. I kept on. I, I was basically reciting to the parrot. Literally, the parrot was in front of me, and I'm reciting to the parrot, and the parrot just like, like I don't know. That scooted away from me, and then I kept on going round, and then anyway, that was quite fun. Mishmish is an interesting parrot because it's, it's joined in the majority of Muhammad Hussein. Oh yeah. He, obviously, he, he he laughs but also cries. He does. And so once my mother, Rahmatullah Ali, was doing a majlis at home, and there was ladies crying, so he came in and joined in, in the middle and started crying. Wow. And I think they all struggled not to laugh in the middle of the majlis. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned you, you mentioned Mali, and 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 we can't finish the show without um, first of all sending her a, a, a fatiha, and may Allah bless her soul. And so for all the marhamin, if you can recite a, a fatiha for the soul of um, your your dear mother, um, who's actually on, on the screen. But tell us a bit about the legacy that she left behind, because a lot of your um, your community work stemmed from her from her work, right? I think uh, my mother played a really powerful role in, in our family, not just in our lives. She um, made a lot of sacrifices uh, in her own life uh, to be hospitable to others. Mm. We had many uh, people who had different challenges. I mean, we've had families stay in our house for six months oh, wow. as refugees, you know, about to be deported, and we've you know, kept them till they've got their paperwork done. Wow. And, and, and that's, you know, that's a difficult experience. Um, alhamdulillah, they're, you know, they're lovely people. And we've had to sometimes, but managing that in a, in a in, you know, London houses are not like Iraq, where you can just fit them in different places. Yeah. And, and so that's, you know, it's been really, um, and she's really been, a, she was a pioneer of her, of, at her time. Uh, and alhamdulillah, her work continues in, in different ways. Inshallah. Inshallah. Um, yeah, I think my mom was telling me actually because you mentioned majalis in her house. My mom was was a, was a regular attendee of uh, of those majalis, and she's she's the one of the kind of, I think the main reciters of uh, of your mother's uh, uh, majalis. Uh, may Allah bless her soul. Um, on a more lighter note, if you don't mind, we have a um, a challenge. This is a a challenge. Essentially, every guest that takes part in the show has to do this challenge. Sometimes the, the Tabasco stuff ranges from other things, but this is um, the mainstay of uh, the show. What it's called, it's called Heads Up. I'm not sure if you've played this game before. Uh, it's totally halal, don't worry. Sure. Essentially what happens is, um, you have a series of occupations which are gonna appear in front of you. Without saying the actual name of the occupation, you have to describe it to me, okay? Describe it in any way, shape or form. You can even act it out if you like. If, you, if I get it right, I will put the phone down. If I get it, or if I, if, if I feel like I'm not gonna get it, for time's sake, I'll pass and I'll put it up, yeah? Um, so far the record is eight. That's by Haid Al-Qazaz, um, who's a fast talker, so he, he got it quite quickly. Um, but let's see how you do. Rules of the game clear? Yes. All right, so this is Heads Up with Hajj Mustafa Field. Here we go. Just describe it as best as you can. Someone who helps with uh, funerals and was in WWF. Undertaker. <laughs> uh, someone who helps uh, um, sell ships. Sell ships? S A cruise? Captain, them. a captain. A more junior. A uh, junior captain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not allowed to say. Let's pass it. <laughs> Photographer. Paparazzi. Yes. Someone who'd look after your children. A babysitter. Uh, this is American. Yes. Right. So it's an American babysitter. I don't know what it's called in, the, in America, but babysitter. Yeah. What is it called in America? Nanny. A nanny. Um, someone who deals with calls, uh, 
and uh, call center a salesman salesman center, no call operator call operator is a call operator <laughs> <laughs> we'll take call operator we can add that to the point poor guy that was a, oh, a sailor okay so sailor operator okay he got four hatch most of them uh, field got four now it's your turn so you're going to uh, essentially do it to me i'm going to describe it to you same way all right uh, flick it down all the way if you get it, if i get it right and flick it up if if um Ah, yeah, just so gonna do like this, yeah, yeah, show it to me. No, no, you can't see it. You just, yeah. Um, the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was a something of California. Uh, governor. Yes. Pull it down. Yes. Uh, someone who sits like me, but delivering what happened during that day. And he says, welcome to the... the presenter. Yes. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, his profession is a... Actor. Yes. Ah, uh, someone who who deals with your eyes and and make sure you got the right glasses. Optician, optician, optometrist. Yeah. Uh, Hassanin. Plumber. No. Builder. No. What is he? What is he built? To put, put together. Forget it. Forget it. Construction worker. That was hard. Um, uh, the 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 main person the 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 main person of a primary school is the 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 headmaster. Yeah. Principal. Yeah. No. Pass that if you can. Yeah, put it down. Uh, animals. Oh, one second. No, I thought we could get it. <laughs> Keeper. And again, this is an American app, so you've got things like governor and news anchor and uh, principal uh, and nanny. Well, that was fun. Okay, cool. So I got five um, with, with Hajj. So I feel, thank you so much for that. Brilliant. Um, so look, moving on, we've got some, some very light questions. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a universal symbol that we know Mustafa Field of, basically, and it's, and it's this. Um, so whenever he walks into any gathering... Um, oh, but first and foremost, we've got some pictures actually we want to talk about. So this is your primary school? Yes, my primary yeah? school, wow. Where is this? In Manchester, I assume? This is in Guildford. Guildford, sorry. Yeah, Guildford, sorry. Yeah, where are you? We can't see you. Uh, Do you even know line, where you are? Front line. Front line, oh, I think I know where you are. Yeah, well, the, well, the light green shirt. Light green shirt, your hands are, your hands yeah. are in front of you. Yeah. Okay, and then growing slightly. Oh, wow. Top right hand corner, I can see you there, there's a smile. Yeah. Top right hand corner, yeah. there's Mustafa Field. Uh, you right are in the right in the middle, at the bottom, is that yeah. you? Yeah. Very handsome. Very, very handsome. Cool. Um, so this is not a Ziyadah trip. Well, we, did, we did go on Ziyadah on that trip, though. So where is uh, this then? This is to Iraq. This is Iraq? Yeah, this is in Iraq. I think the guy in the next sitting on my lap literally is uh, from Nasriya. I think he came and joined us. Huh. One of the random Iraqis that we... Uh, they do that, don't they? They love to photo... Iraqis love to photo bomb. It was a good trip. Um, this is one of the more interface stuff that you so did. So this is the first iftar to take place in Lambeth Palace. In what palace? So, Lambeth Palace, which is the home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Wow. So we pushed for an Afghan, it's the first one. And so so and who's who from right to left? So from right is Toby Howard, Bishop Toby Howard now, Sheikh Ibrahim Mogra, uh, Sister Zahra. I'll go back to um, the image. Justin Welby, who's the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah. Um, Julie Siddiqui, who is one of the coordinators for the Big Iftar, myself, and, uh, and Sister Alia Azam. Fantastic. Uh, yes. How was that received? I think it was really positive. It was a, it was a historic moment to us to get an iftar set up at the Lambeth Palace and get them to, you know, from you know, in some ways Justin Welby's you know a strong evangelical Christian leader, nice. and to to see, see sharing these traditions amongst faiths is, is quite important. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, just make dua. Where was this, and, oh, and, I, and I, why I, did that I, happen? I can know. Um, I think uh, we were going to meet someone, so I just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Have you still got that t-shirt? I've like got that t-shirt. It's really, really nice. Um, yeah, and actually. you're wearing a sombrero on yeah, the other one? With a COVID mask, I guess, yeah. Oh my God, <laughs> I can see who's giving all these photos now. <laughs> <laughs> can you expose them? Who was it? Um, uh, I think the producers... Uh, oh, right. I think, okay. yeah, I think I might get told. Uh, oh my God, maybe with one of my pigeons. You were quite young here. I don't know. You collect a lot of animals, don't you? I do have a, lot, a large collection, yes. What, who, what, else, what else have you Pigeons, collected? Pigeons, parrots. Uh, Pigeons, parrots, rabbits. All different types of birds. And, and even right. some chickens, although they're not with me at the moment. 
This is you hard at work at eight o'clock in the evening, by the way, yeah? Uh, where is this? I can't remember this. I can't see what I'm showing. Um, okay. Yes. That's the next one. Ah, I see where we were. Yes, this is in Birmingham. And uh, you've got two images. I yeah, I, yeah I don't know which one. I, I so which one whatever's going to appear on this one is going to appear on there. Okay. So have a so little this is uh, our part of our uh, campaigning material. So whenever to promote uh, Love Message of Love, we have a campaign okay. called Turn to Love. So I had a couple of partners nice. in the office. Uh, I think the next one's going to be a nice selfie with flowers. Oh, so this is some place where you all have to go to. Okay. Uh, it's in Wembley. It's a new um, ice cream dessert place. Okay. Uh, HD something like that. All right. I don't know. It's one of these places, but it's a really lovely place. Why not? I'll uh, know. Inshallah, maybe uh, the channel will even get you out there and experience different types of dessert. Let's see. I, d <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> Let's you know, see. Re review, Ali Afala re reviewing different desserts across the UK. Yeah, so that one, this is a slightly controversial one, but we're going to put it any on, on anyway. Um, let's see what the, uh, the uh, so it's on the screen now. On, on your phone <laughs> is a picture of Prince of Saudi. Yeah, you're under, under the um, yeah. feet of... Uh, Ah, uh, that's the whole point of it, under yeah. the feet of Sayyid, uh, Allah rahmah, may God bless yeah. his soul, uh, Sayyid Majid al Khoi. Yeah. All right. Uh, interesting times. You were on a diet at one time in your life? Uh, this is actually a gift. Um, I, I'm very lucky. Actually, this is my wife's friend who gave us a gift. Nice. Um, I can't remember what the occasion was, but you know, the, the female side, of, like the women that tend to be much more generous in giving gifts <laughs> than, uh, men. than my men, so uh, <laughs> men friends. Uh, this was actually something that she, uh, I think she put made. together. All right, fantastic. Um, so obviously tea was served with that. So tell us about more of your obsession with tea. As I was mentioning, any gathering, any program that had to have tea, and so. So you know I have dual heritage. English uh -huh. is famous for the tea, and Iraq is famous for the tea. Uh -huh. so of course, that manifestation comes together. So it's a double thing. And obviously, okay. I mix with many of the scholars and ulama. And if you visit Najaf and Qom, <laughs> there's always chai <laughs> brewing in the background. So that's uh, obviously something that we've learned. From What's the our best learning. tea that you've had? Oh, uh, I'll give a. Uh, uh, I think you guys should check out chai wala in Preston. Uh, really? <laughs> Do you like the tea? So you like chai karak? Yeah. Oh, you're, you're a huge fan of chai karak. Yes. I can't stand the smell of it, uh, I'm genuinely. Um, Arak tea, do you ever have any of that? Especially oh. on the Mashaya and Arba'in and stuff like that? Or I on think, the street I, I, tea? I think street. the ziyara gives it a special blessing. Yeah? yeah I think what about street tea? Where it's, it's basically sugar with tea, not, not tea with I sugar. Mean, to be honest, in the, uh, chai on the street tea is like, a, like the hygiene is one question as well. Like, you know, they even wash the, the glasses. So that's, <laughs> you hope the boiling water that they're pouring in kills any form of virus <laughs> that's in it. Exactly. Then, but, the, but the concentration of sugar might allow the viruses to spread. <laughs> so I've avoided uh, um, street teas for at least uh, my last two trips to Iraq. Oh, really? Because, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's quite dangerous because you don't want to get ill in Iraq. It's, it's, not, it's not fun. Uh, sports, are you, are you a fan of sport? So okay. I'm an old Trafford boy, so uh, okay. Manchester United. Manchester uh, football United. is uh, a big fan of football. Good. Um, I want to You've been to a couple of England matches. Yes, yeah. uh, unfortunately they didn't. I don't have that. I know there was an image somewhere of you sleeping on a coach wearing an England shirt. I don't know where it is. For the life of me, I couldn't find it. But I knew it's, it's I, out there I, somewhere. We, we went as diehard fans, uh, a shit bus. Where did you go? All to Germany? Way. To Germany. Yeah, it was in Germany, wasn't it? Was it? A, it was a good group of us, alhamdulillah. All the, all the brothers who were helping us in Majalis, we decided to do our ziyara, <laughs> to support <laughs> England uh, in, in losing another World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brilliant. The intention was good. Yeah. Um, so, look, I mean, and you, you mentioned a lot of interesting things that happened over the, the, the pandemic period. Over the last 18 months, 20 months, what, what have you learned? Um, I think people have connected faith in a different way than they have had before. And even, you know, like I think how our majalis have manifested online, I know it's not the same mm. too, but we've been able to, in some ways, be enriched by so much more um, and seeing how we can connect. But also I think it gives a big gap in how, how much more we need to do, how much we need to raise the bar. Mm. If we were going to, you know, entertain our children um, you know, it has been difficult in, in terms of, and I, you know, you know, pin, pin not being able to go out, being scared to go to parks. To be honest, at some time, at some yeah. stages, you know, we didn't know. Especially, you know, I think the first first wave was was a bit scary. It was full lockdown. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's full. You know, literally, you you know, you couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. And so I think it's been it's been a blessing in some ways that we've seen how faith is so important. It's connected people back to the religion. That's not just through in, in, in our tradition, but across different faiths. And I think that's 
something really important because we live in this world of science yeah. and it could have easily been that you know religion won't help you science you have to follow medicine but actually yeah. people saw the cornerstone of our well-being our positive energy comes from our identity and our faith mm. okay um, what are you most thankful for I think you know thankful for family and friends I think we probably don't always appreciate how lucky we are to be so close to family and friends and people who are lovers uh, of our faith and our traditions and, and I think that's something really important you know I think a lot of people miss that out and even when you know you, you, know, you just I just remember the, the, some of the guys that Umrah because like I remember some of them saying that you know you the Umrah was our connection to people through our yeah. faith because you know they live in place like Wales where there's no one there so yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. so but alhamdulillah I think that you know that you know, having family and friends around us is really really important absolutely um, this might be an obvious question but who's your biggest inspiration and why I'm going to say my parents. I know yeah. it's a, uh, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, they're, they're, our religious leaders are, are hugely inspiring, but I think my parents taught us in real life, in action, that making self-sacrifice yeah. is important. And I think when we try to practice our faith, by data are really important, learning about uh, how we learn about uh, our religious traditions and our, the, the Masaib and, but actually, Going the next level and putting our faith into practice often requires self-sacrifice. I think that embedding that in, in the family home has is, is, is helped define some of the work that I've done. I think, um, inshallah, that's, you know, I've, I've found that very, that's made me, uh, made it more natural for me to do. Because I, I, I speak to a lot of people and it is very difficult sometimes to make time to care for others. That is very difficult and in these days you see people who even have, you know who are lonely who just need a phone call yeah. once a week and yeah. you know they're going through different cool things and some of us we just can't make time of it for it yeah. because we're so busy ingrained in our lives and that means we have to make a sacrifice in 30 seconds Haji, uh, Haji Mustafa what's what's next for you now what's next for uh, Mustafa Field OBE I think uh, it shouldn't be about Mustafa Field it needs to be about how we build our community how we make sure our faith is represented in the COP26, the biggest environmental conference ever to take place. Where is the practice and ideas? In the UN, talk about the persecution of the Hazara, for example, in Afghanistan, how they are being persecuted. You know, the Americans have just made a treaty with the uh, Taliban. I don't see, think their conditions are going to be better. Mm. And we've got people, believers across the world who are being persecuted. We need to make sure that our voice, and for me, I guess that's my next journey, is make sure how can I be, play a role in building people and supporting people to be uh, the voice of our faith uh, in the world, in the international community. Fantastic. Look, one of the things that resonated with me was self-sacrifice, uh, Hajj Mustafa, and, that, and that's why I particularly chose that story um, on, on Imam Hussain Ali salam and Imam Hassan and when Imam Hussain actually asked his companion, you know, why did you not go to Imam Hussain? Imam Hussain clearly, uh, well, Imam Hussain uh, clearly said, or the companion actually clearly said that Imam Hussain was, was worshipping, but if he had the opportunity to serve you, opportunity to solve your problem, have that self-sacrifice, he would have um, he would have put his ibadah to a side to help that person. I think that's what resonated um, with me from what we talked about today. Um, look, really, really, honestly, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, brother. You're a very, very busy man. You have another daughter, mashallah, and you've also got another daughter uh, who also needs your attention. So, um, and there's there's many meetings that we've already seen that you that you have. So, look, thank you so much um, for your time. Really, really appreciate. It. Wishing you all the best. Um, any last words? Pleasure joining you. I think you know. Um, let us. Um, not see ourselves as so small. We have so much potential as a community. We have so much capabilities. Let us aim high. And inshallah, we, we, we follow in those footsteps. Inshallah, with the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will aim high. Uh, on that note, thank you so much for watching The Late Night Show. It's higher. Um, huh? It's higher. <laughs> you know what? You're the only one that's actually mentioned that track um, out of all of my guests. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm your biggest fan or you're my biggest fan. I'm not sure. Either or, either or. But a lot of love, a lot of love for Hajj Mustafa. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Yeah, again, thank you so much uh, for watching, dear guests, on the late night show. Inshallah, we will see you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi
Farm Hussein TV3 wants to improve their content to ensure that we meet our goal, which is to encourage, inform, and educate the Shia around the world about the teachings from the Holy Household, the Ahlul Bayt. For us to do this, we need your help. Complete our survey and tell us which programs you like, what you'd like to see more of, and what we could do better. The survey takes less than a minute, but you could be within a chance to win a ring made from the marble from the holy shrine of Imam Hussein Imam Hussein TV3, your gateway to Karbala.